What's the difference between a man and a woman? This might seem like an easy question to answer. A man has a penis, a woman has a vagina. In this course, we'll certainly be discussing the anatomical differences between men and women. But is this the only difference that we should be thinking about? Is my understanding of what makes a man a man and a woman a woman the same as yours? And is an adult's perception of male-female differences the same as a child's? Most children don't have preconceived notions or prejudices about sex and gender like adults do. So we thought it would be really interesting to ask some children to draw a picture illustrating the differences between a man and a woman. Here are a few of the examples of what they created. As you can see, most children focused on external genitalia. Men have a penis, women have breasts and a vagina. If you'd like to see all of the pictures, check out the gallery provided after this video. You might be surprised at how, well, graphic these pictures are. But for us, they were expected. The children knew we were developing a course on sex and reproduction, so their focus was unsurprisingly on external genitalia. But we were surprised by some of the very specific features that they drew. Several drawings included menstrual blood in women, as well as semen in men. This demonstrates a surprisingly advanced level of understanding of reproductive matters. One thing that we weren't surprised about in the illustrations was how children perceived gender. Women have long hair, men have short hair. Women are skinny or curvaceous, men have body hair and muscles. Research has shown that children have a fairly mature understanding of gender and gender roles by the age of eight or nine years. And they recognize that gender is in keeping with biological or physical sex. In the next segment of this course, we will further explore the concepts of biological sex and gender in more detail. So stay tuned. Reproduction in humans involves sex. But what do these words sex and reproduction actually mean? Is my understanding of these terms the same as yours? I'll start with the word reproduction. In science, reproduction is the biological process by which new individuals called offspring are produced from parents. Reproduction is a fundamental feature of all life but not all reproduction is the same. In nature, two forms of reproduction occur, asexual and sexual reproduction. The difference between these forms of reproduction comes down to one simple question, one parent or two. In asexual reproduction, there is only one parent. This single parent gives rise to offspring that are genetically identical to the parent. Bacteria and viruses are two good examples of organisms that reproduce asexually. In contrast, sexual reproduction occurs in humans and requires two parents, a male and a female, to produce an offspring. Males produce sperm and females produce eggs, and each of them contains different genes from each parent. When sperm and egg meet at fertilization, these different genes mix. As a result, the child produced is genetically different from both of its parents. Okay, that's reproduction defined, but what about sex? Well, the word sex usually has two different meanings, depending on how it's used in a sentence. All he ever thinks about is sex. In this instance, the word sex actually refers to sexual intercourse, which is the most common definition of the word sex. Sexual intercourse is the physical sexual activity between two people. Other scientific words for sexual intercourse include coitus and copulation. You'll learn more about the process of sexual intercourse later in the course. So now let's take a look at another example of how the word sex is used in context. Please tell me your date of birth, age and sex. 
In this example, the word sex refers to the male or female label that each of us is assigned at birth. Scientists refer to this as the biological sex, and it's based on what genitals and chromosomes a newborn has at birth. If you have a penis and XY chromosomes, you're a male. If you have a vagina and XX chromosomes, you're a female. So biological sex is simple, right? Well, not quite. There's a lot more to being a male or female than the biological sex that you're assigned at birth. Some people are born with a mixture of male and female biological traits that makes it really difficult to be labelled as either male or female. These people are referred to as intersex. According to the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, intersex people do not fit the typical definitions for male or female bodies. For example, some intersex people have both ovaries and testes. Other intersex people have a different combination of chromosomes, like XXY. And some intersex people are born with what looks like totally male or totally female external genitals, but their internal organs or hormones don't match. If you are interested in learning more about intersex, we've provided several web links below this video, so you can explore this topic further. And we've also provided a definition for the word gender and explained how gender is different from biological sex. That's because historically the terms gender and sex have been used interchangeably. But in modern society, we've come to realise that they actually have very different meanings. Keep watching. In the next video, you'll explore the differences between biological sex and gender identity. And you'll hear from Dr. Carol Kaur, a sexual health physician at the Adelaide Sexual Health Centre. Okay, I'm a sexual health physician and I'm involved in sexual health medicine, which is a very well-established specialised field of medicine. And it's concerned basically with um, healthy sexual relations, including freedom from sexually transmitted infections, uh, unplanned pregnancy, so we're looking at fertility regulation, uh, freedom from coercion, so we're looking at sexual assault, and physical and psychological discomfort associated with sexuality. Okay, I suppose you can actually define it as um, a person's sense of identification with either male or female sex. And this is as manifested in, in appearance, behaviour or other aspects of a person's life. So if you want to look at a definition, I think that that is what you would find a lot of dictionaries saying what gender identity actually means. I think to actually understand that, that you need to look at perhaps the concept of um, gender identity dys dysphoria or um, gender identity disorder. The other word for that is transsexualism. So in this situation there is a very strong and lasting cross-gender identification and persistent discomfort with one's biological sex okay, and one's gender sex. And this discomfort is really, really quite um, uh, a problem causing significant amount of distress and impairment in that person's functioning. So you can see in this situation one's identity is very, very different from the biological sex. To understand what determines gender identity, I think we need to go back to the definition of core gender identity. So it's that deep inner feeling that a child actually has um, about whether he or she is male or female. So there is a lot of uncertainty about where that comes from, whether it's because of um, a, a physical sort of uh, etiology from the body, whether it's mental, for example, from the hypothalamus region of the brain itself. Um, 
this debate in this determination of maleness and femaleness is actually shaped by many things. So it could include hormones, for example, testosterone and estrogen, or it could be the genes as well, um, um, which has been designed basically at conception. So really, there are lots and lots of possible reasons why this has occurred, but suffice to say that it is enforced at puberty and once it's basically established, it's generally for life. I suppose you can describe it as perhaps a sexual attraction or feelings of one person to another. And there can be very many interpretations of that. Sexual orientation is, is evolving really. And when people are often ask, how many different sorts of sexual orientations do the people have? There are many. I the last time I counted, there were about 30. However, this will keep on changing. And I might just name you a few of those if, if you actually like. So other than the gay, lesbian, bisexual, or queer, or the LGBTQ, there are other sexual orientations like closeted, bi-curious, demisexual, uh, gynesexual, uh, polyamorous. These are amongst a few of how people identify themselves as. And watch the space, it will continue to actually involve as people feel more free to actually express their own sexual orientation and identity. My name is Alison Dundon and I'm a lecturer here at the University of Adelaide in Sociocultural Anthropology. I study in particular gender and sexuality. Um, obviously there's a great variety of the ways in which intersex people are viewed in Western societies, but one of the primary things that intersex people um, are perceived as is being outside of the binary gender system. So as a result, many of them have suffered a great deal in terms of discrimination, feeling shamed, uh, having their bodies um, um, changed hormonally or via surgical interventions. So we only have in, um, sort of really recent statements and changes in law across Western societies. In Australia, for example, in 2013, there was an amendment to the Sexual Discrimination Act under which intersex people can no longer be discriminated against under law. Um, in, in terms of uh, Malta, Malta was the first country in the world to actually, um, in 2015, uh, pass a law against illegal or non-consensual surgical interventions for intersex people um, and the Council of Europe followed with several other forms of anti-discrimination statements and so on. And in 2017 there was another statement, the Darlington Declaration argued that all intersex people must be free of sexual discrimination, discrimination more generally and have a right to self-determination. Well, across the world, there's a great variation of how intersex people are viewed and understood and how obviously they experience being intersex. Uh, one of the big issues for um, this kind of discussion, understanding this, is the ways in which people and societies have different understandings of gender systems. So in the West, as we spoke about, it's often a notion of two genders, male and female. Across the world, there are various societies who talk about and understand the world in terms of up to five genders. And I'm going to follow and, and look at three particular examples. But firstly, I just wanted to suggest that there are also commonalities. One commonality is that it's really hard to define intersex globally precisely because there are so many different kinds of communities who um, refer to themselves as intersex or are referred to as intersex. Secondly, a great deal of those communities, if not all, uh, face a lot of stigma and discrimination. So thirdly, intersex people are often connected to the spiritual world, whether deities or being possessed by spirits and so on. So there's often a connection between being intersex and being um, 
connected to the spiritual. There are three particular examples I would like to talk about today. One is the Hijra of South Asia. Now the Hijra in India in particular, but throughout the South Asian continent, are uh, understood as the third gender and it has legally been institutionalised in, in um, several countries. The Hijra are an ancient population. They are, the Hijra was always a term that was used to, in the early text, to talk about intersex people, but nowadays incorporates transgender and sometimes people who identify as gay as well. So Hijra have a special connection to several Hindu deities who also have what are understood to be hermaphroditic um, characteristics. So Hijra are traditionally intersex um, children who are given to particular Hijra communities at a young age. But these days there are a lot of um, Hijra who are actually born male and then try to seek to transform their bodies through um, surgical castration and so on. But Hydra understand their connection to the Hindu deities as the thing that sets them apart. In Indian society, Hydra are not understood to be either male or female. They are understood to be something above and beyond that. So their connection to the deities give them options to bless people and largely that is what Hydra do. They bless people at their weddings, they bless them at the birth of a child and so on. The Hydra also suffer, despite this, great discrimination and certainly since British colonial rule, the role of the Hydra um, has changed quite radically and they do sort of live on the margins of society. Many Hydra also now do sex work um, and uh, live outside of these small communities. Amongst the Bugis who live in Indonesia and South Sulawesi, there is a group of people who are referred to as Bisu, who are shamanic priests. And these bisu are understood to be gender transcendent or to have a category that is above gender, so paragender. And in this particular community, there are four other genders as well. So intersex people are understood to be above gender in this particular context. Now the bisu are, have a, a very um, strong and powerful relationship with the deities, many of whom also you look to the... Um, look to the busu to actually come down in human form and, um, be po and possess these particular shamanic priests. Um, during that time, people in the community can talk to the gods, can be blessed by the gods, can receive all sorts of different sort of um, uh, good, good things at that time. Bisu can dress as men or women, they can do male or female activities and in this particular community intersex people who are Bisu are treated with great reverence. The Kathoi of Thailand, better known as Lady Boys, um, are an, another ancient society or community who include the intersex. Originally Kathoi was a term defined pr primarily for intersex people but now takes in a wider meaning of people who identify as transgender as well as people who identify as gay. Um, Kathoi have again a long history in Thailand but nowadays have a much more populist kind of persona. Many people have heard of the lady boys throughout. Katoi is the word or comes from a um, Buddhist word for the fourth gender. So again, in this kind of a society, there is an understanding of four genders, not two. So Katoi um, do suffer a great deal of discrimination and stigma in Thailand and do not at this point um, have access to opportunities like education, employment, accommodation, and other kinds of things.